Welcome to In Touch. I'm Lucy Sondles with David Rodich at Woodland Cemetery. Well, David, it uh, isn't exactly warm today, but at least it's not raining. At least we escaped that. I thought with the coming to an end of the summer season as nature ends a cycle, it might be interesting to pay a visit to our Woodlawn Cemetery where life cycle comes to an end and see some of the interesting landmarks and points of interest that we have here. I have a, a favorite monument that I always admire when I pass Woodland Cemetery, and it's the Curtis Monument. What's the history behind that one? Well, that's one of the things that I find so interesting about walking through the cemetery, because regardless of a person's station in life, we all come to the same end. But some people choose to mark their uh, final resting place in a rather grand style, others in a more uh, simple way. W.P. Curtis was a druggist in Wadsworth. He opened the drugstore where John Hanna's office is on Broad Street in 1861 and was also one of the founders of the first Wadsworth Bank. He and his wife had only one child, Willie. And Mr. Curtis lived almost directly across from the cemetery here on College Street. And when Willie was 10 years old, he was riding a wagon down the College Street hill and ran into an iron fence and punctured himself and contracted blood poisoning and died a short time later. And the parents never recovered from their grief. And to mark Willie's grave and also as a monument for the entire Curtis family, W.P. Curtis erected this very large monument here. But also uh, there are monuments in our cemetery that uh, are more simple, but the sentiments expressed by them are no less profound. Well, we'll take a look at one of those. This older stone is quite beautiful, too. This one is just across the way, across the uh, walkway from the Curtis Monument. And this is a stone, a monument for Clara, who was the infant daughter of the Reverend S.P.J. Jacobs, who was the Methodist clergyman. And she died in 1869. And it bears the simple inscription on the front, little and sweet. And I'm sure those sentiments were just as sincere uh, from her parents as Mr. Curtis's was when he dedicated that large monument to uh, his son. Uh, Woodlawn Cemetery comprises over 32 acres, and so there are thousands and thousands of stones, and we can't look at them all. But there are some other interesting ones I'd like to point out. Okay, well, we'll take a look at those now. There's uh, markers here that don't necessarily represent a grave. What's this one about, David? Well, that's true. There are a lot of different types of monuments that will pass on our walk today. And this particular one marks the uh, burial site of a time capsule that was placed here in 1964 on the occasion of Wadsworth's 150th anniversary. And they had a, a large burial vault on the square. At that time, as we saw in some of our earlier films, all of the festivities, the carnival-type activities, took place on the square on Main Street. And this vault was displayed along with a list of all the different items that were included in it. And then on the Saturday at the end of the celebration, it was brought down here. And a large ceremony was held with uh, Mayor Jack Summers reading a proclamation stating that this was to be interred here until the year 2014, which will be, of course, Wadsworth's 200th anniversary, at which time it will be unearthed and the relics from the past uh, opened. And remembering the day that it was buried, I guess that makes me one of the relics of the past. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're still here to share with us. Another landmark, I guess, is the um, landmark of the soldier that many people notice as they drive by Woodland. What's the history of this one, David? Well, that's right. A lot of the people who are buried in this cemetery are veterans of the various wars. And this particular uh, monument was erected by the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, in honor of their fallen comrades. And it was uh, built in 1912, and it was placed on the square in front of the bandstand. And when that, uh, when the park, the East Park, was narrowed in 1948, 
it was necessary to remove the statue and it was brought down here to the cemetery. The base was carved by Hawkinsmith Granite Works, which made many of the monuments in this cemetery, and the statue itself was manufactured by the Mullins Manufacturing Company. And originally the veterans had planned to have it cast out of silver, but apparently donations weren't strong enough, yeah. and so they decided on bronze instead. On the Halloween following its move down to the cemetery, it was pulled from its pedestal and uh, was severely damaged and was relegated to a trash heap at the powerhouse. And Councilman Joe Griesmer uh, took an interest in it and rallied for funds at City Council to have it repaired. And there was a lot of the usual grumbling that goes on about such things. And someone said, well, why should we have it repaired? Who's it a statue of anyway? And spotting the service director, Frank Randall, he said, well, that's Colonel Randall. <laughs> and they couldn't argue with that, so they voted the funds to have it repaired. And we, uh, as one of our bicentennial projects in 1976, some restoration work was also done to it. And it stands here as a monument to our fallen soldiers, as do some others that we'll see later. Also a monument to civic pride, after all. Yes. This gravestone is quite hard to read, but still it's important, isn't it? It is because it marks the first burial in Woodlawn Cemetery. Now, the first death in the Wadsworth Pioneer community was of Seth Lucas, who died in 1815 and was buried in the forest near his cabin home. In 1817, the first burial was made in the Waltz Burying Ground, or the High Church Burying Ground, that we visited on a previous show. But in 1817, the infant daughter of Judge uh, Frederick Brown died, and there was no place at that time set aside for the burial of people. His brother, Owen Brown of Hudson, the father of the abolitionist John Brown, donated this acre of ce the cemetery uh, for cemetery purposes. It formed the original acre of Woodlawn Cemetery. But still, the Brown family reserved the pasture right. So as people were buried here and monuments were erected to mark their graves, cattle and, and sheep were still grazing over the lot and they would eat the flowers and knock down the stones and generally make a mess of the place. And this was still very much a forest area and in 1820 a logging bee was held among the pioneers to clear off uh, most of the timber off this area so it would be more suitable for burying. But still little was done with it until 1851 when some of the city fathers uh, became concerned about the dilapidated condition of the place and held a town meeting to decide what to do. And trustees were elected at that point and they began to care for the cemetery. Uh, originally the road was laid out in 1835 through the center where the walkway is now. But in 1851 when these other improvements were made, that was turned into a walkway and the driveways on the east and west side of this original acre were established. And these trustees were continually re-elected year after year uh, because of the interest that they shown in the grounds and their uh, efforts to preserve it. Was it a more wooded um, cemetery at that time, or did they just remove all the trees? No, there were still a great number of trees in the area. Many of them were elm trees, which were lost to the Dutch elm disease a few years back. Mm -hmm. But as improvements were made, uh, there were ponds within the cemetery. We'll see a little bit more of that later. And uh, the front of the cemetery, in fact, had was never used for burial. It was decorated with flower beds and gardens. And at one time, the word Woodlawn was spelled out in white letters across the cemetery. These were later removed, but the uh, name Woodlawn in brick that we saw at the opening of the show was placed there as an Eagle Scout project about 1980 by Bob Crawford. And uh, so it now marks the entrance to the cemetery. And at one time also there was a fountain in the front of the cemetery. So it made it very inviting and there were wrought iron fences mm -hmm. around. 
I always wondered what the space right out front was. It seemed like there would be room for another monument of sorts. There has been talk in past years about putting some, another veterans type mm -hmm. monument, perhaps an amphitheater or some type of a monument to the World War II and Korean and Vietnam War veterans. But to uh, this point, it's not materialized. Okay. Well, what will we be seeing next? Well, we're going to make our way farther back into the cemetery and take a look at uh, some of the names that help make Wadsworth the city that it is. Okay. Well, we've moved to another stone that's of interest, and this one is Sylvia's. Yes. Uh, we have to remember as we walk through the grounds that each stone represents a person who once lived and played and worked and had happiness and sorrows just like all of us do. And we've talked previously about the sad story of Sylvia Beach, who came here with her family and was lost in the woods and never found. And the other stones for the Beach family have had to be placed in the ground because of vandalism through the years. But Sylvia's stone has remained. And in just recent years, they've, uh, Mr. Pertit, who does the engraving for the cemetery, has come and re-engraved the legend on the back of the stone so that it will be preserved for future generations as the original inscription begins to wear away. And there's some other uh, important families that are buried near here. I, I see one name that is actually familiar to me. Well, in fact, for those who saw the program where we visited the Western Star Cemetery, or the Town Line Cemetery, they'll remember my mentioning the fact that one particular family, the Spragues, have consistently used the same type of tombstone regardless of where they're buried. And we saw this type of tombstone there at Western Star. It's a concrete construction with a bronze plate uh, inserted in it with the names of those buried around it. And here in Wadsworth Cemetery, we find a similar stone. If you haven't taken a walk in Woodland Cemetery in a long time, there are so many beautiful statues here. And, and here's another one that David will tell us about. Well, this is a monument marking the grave of John McGregor. And John McGregor was a Scotsman who believed that Scotland should be independent from Great Britain. And he was part of a uh, group that tried to overthrow the monarchy and run them out of Scotland. The plot was discovered, and it was necessary for him to flee to America. He began teaching school in Sharon and was lured away by the trustees of the Wadsworth Academy. He agreed to come here to teach if the school could be taught year-round and if they would build a school building for the purpose. And believe it or not, they did it. <laughs> And they built what was known as the Octagonal Academy on the site of the present Trinity Church. And in fact, this building later served as the first home of the Trinity Congregation. And Mr. McGregor taught here uh, very successfully for a number of years before moving on to other pursuits. But his grave in Wadsworth was marked by a simple marble slab, as we've seen around the cemetery. But as his former students prospered in life, they felt that their educator should receive greater recognition. And so a, a drive was begun to uh, give him a suitable monument. And one of the leaders of this drive was Milton Henry, who had been a former student of McGregor's and was the uncle of Laura Spellman Rockefeller, the wife of John D. Rockefeller, who, as we have mentioned before, was born on Main Street in Wadsworth. And in October of 1887, 103 years ago, this monument was dedicated. It's, uh, the statue itself is of marble and was carved in Rome, and it rests upon a pedestal of granite from McGregor's native Scotland. Unfortunately, in recent years, like so many of our fine monuments in the cemetery, vandals have uh, attacked this one on numerous occasions. Mr. McGregor originally was pointing to a book in his hand, and that was broken off and lost. Now, a lot of times for the purposes of telecast, we've used 8x10 glossy reproductions of older photographs, and these have generally, general, generally <laughs> been supplied to me. Uh, I should have been in Mr. McGregor's class, I've got a feeling. Uh, it's been supplied to me uh, by Bob Durhammer, the owner of Hartman Studio, or by Joe Klosterman, the Sun Banner Pride photographer. But oftentimes you're not certain in these modern reproductions whether or not 
something's been cropped from the photographs or whether they tell the whole story. So it's important to find an original photograph. And I had an original photograph of that dedication ceremony and thought that I knew the whole story, but I found out there was a little more to it, as we can see if we take a look at those photos. As we look at this photograph, we can see that it's an original. It's on the cardboard backing with Captain T.D. Woolbaugh's name on the side. And, of course, it's a darker photograph. It's aged. And you would think that that was all there was to see. But then recently, I was given another photograph of the same scene, obviously taken at the same time, and we see an entire uh, other group of people off to the side where it's been cut off in the first picture. So sometimes just because you have an original doesn't mean you have the whole story. In this picture, interesting enough, is uh, Aaron Pardee, the first mayor of Wadsworth, with the white beard. Next to him with the black beard and the plug hat is John Clark, the editor of Wadsworth's first newspaper. In the background, in the high hat, is Dr. C.N. Lyman, who was the uh, president of the Wadsworth National Bank. And on the far side, in the back, up against the tree, a tree that's still there, in the band hat, is E.S. Pardee, the son of Aaron, who was also twice mayor of Wadsworth and an attorney at law. So sometimes you have to do a little more research. You can't be overconfident that you know the whole story. David has a picture for almost every occasion. And here's a picture you've seen before on our Memorial Day program. But we're right at the actual spot. Well, Wadsworth, of course, was not founded until 1814, but four of our residents had served in the Revolutionary War. And in 1923, the Cuyahoga Portage chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution dedicated this monument that's next to us uh, in honor of those uh, Revolutionary War veterans who are buried in Woodlawn and also the veterans who are buried in Western Star Cemetery. And when we visited Western Star, we looked at some of their graves. And here we have another war memorial for a different war. Well, just right next to the Revolutionary Monument is the monument to the veterans of the Spanish-American War. And this monument was placed in the 1930s at the east end of the Broad Street Park. And again, as with Colonel Randall, this monument was moved to the cemetery when the park was narrowed in 1948. A distinctive thing about this monument. Of course, it has a bronze plaque explaining about the war, and it's mounted on a boulder that came from the Treese farm. But a distinctive feature of it is the porthole at the bottom, which is an actual porthole from the battleship Maine, the, uh, ex the bombing of which in Havana Harbor precipitated the Spanish-American War in 1898. Well, by 1875, that original acre that had been donated by Owen Brown had begun to fill, and new lands for the cemetery were necessary. So Aaron Pardee, our first mayor, donated a third of an acre lying to the north of that original acre, and in fact found his resting place here also, as did his family. Now, when I was a child, this area was surrounded by an iron fence, but as time passed because of the difficulty with upkeep and so forth, many of the lots within Woodlawn that were surrounded by railings or fences uh, had them removed. Uh, I mentioned, of course, Aaron Pardee being the first mayor, and as we walk today, we're going to see a lot of names that are familiar to us as men who had served as chief executives of the village and later of the city of Wadsworth. Of all the mayors uh, who have died, all of them are interred in Wadsworth Woodlawn Cemetery, except six of them. Edwin Farr and his brother-in-law, George Brown, are buried in the Sharon Cemetery. Norm Stein is buried in the Masonic section of the Greenlawn Cemetery. Uh, Jack Summer is buried in the Hillcrest Cemetery, which of course is also in this city. Uh, Charles Gardner, uh, who was a jeweler, we're not too sure what happened to him. And I was able to trace him as late as 1914, and he was still living someplace. 
but not Wadsworth, and I don't know where he's buried. And W.E. Beardsley, uh, who was a harness maker and also one of the early, he was the fifth mayor of Wadsworth, I believe is buried in the Cincinnati area. But uh, we'll see a lot of those names as we walk today. And in fact, right behind us is uh, the third mayor of Wadsworth, John Clark, who was also the editor, uh, first editor of the Wadsworth newspaper, the Wadsworth Enterprise, in 1866. Well, let's take a look at uh, some other headstones. This is Evelyn S. Pardee, whom David pointed out in the picture we had of the McGregor dedication. He was also a mayor of Wadsworth. Even though his name was Evelyn, it was a man's name. And here we have the grave of Marion Lytle, who was a 20th century mayor and by profession was an educator. Methodist clergyman Tom Browning was the second chief executive of Wadsworth and also served another term later on. He is responsible for bringing the press to Wadsworth because of a fight that he had with the Beacon Publishing Company and was described by historians as being as pompous behind his desk as an oriental demagogue. Perhaps a description that suited him in both of his callings. Well, Lucy, we're at the grave of a man who's a personal hero of mine, and I think it's probably, the name is probably familiar to a lot of the people who've been following our programs. T.D. Woolbaugh was the photographer of Wadsworth from 1866 into 1928, and of course bequeathed his collection of curios as Indian and military uh, relics to Wadsworth as a nucleus for a museum. And his four remaining volumes of the Woolbaugh Diaries serve as a constant source of information. Uh, and he also served as the 11th mayor of Wadsworth. Some people may be curious about the fact that his tombstone bears the inscription Corporal, and he did achieve that rank during his service in the Civil War, but later was the first captain of the Wadsworth National Guard, and it was by that title that he was there after known. As he was described by his friend, the historian Peter Cherry, the wool ball with his extravagant gestures and mighty rhetoric, always ready for a bout. I think he'd be pleased that we were here today. The stone we're going to talk about, to me, is a good example of the kind of detective work that you do, David. Well, the original stones, the earlier stones in the cemetery, most of them were made in Wadsworth because we had a stone carver here in 1817. But as people prospered and wanted some of the grander monuments, they would send away to Akron or later uh, as far away as to New England. And if you look at some of the stones in the oldest part of the cemetery, you'll notice that uh, some of the names are misspelled on them. But they weren't returned because they were too difficult to ship back and forth. And uh, also in those days, people weren't quite as literate as we hope they are today. And sometimes they just didn't notice the difference. And also, as a lot of the German families Americanized their names, there would be two or three different variations of the spelling. But as people desired uh, fancier stones, um, granite moving away from the marble and sandstone that we saw in the older uh, versions, uh, the designs and, and the different types of styles were almost endless. And in fact, you could even order stones from the Sears Roebuck catalog. Uh, but one very distinctive stone is the one in front, uh, in front of us, and it marks the grave of George Cochran, who was killed in 1912. George Cochran, as you can see by his uh, epitaph, is called a fireman. And to our way of thinking today, when we think of a fireman, we think of someone like on the Wadsworth Fire Department Force who saves us from fires. But the older meaning of a fireman is someone who fires a, a boiler in a train or in a factory. And Mr. Cochran was a fireman on a train. And on, he had done this, he was a veteran trainsman. He had done it over 40 years. And on a trip returning to Wadsworth, to his home, they were held up in the Akron train yards uh, because of a, another train blocking the way. 
And while he was waiting, he figured he would run and get a sandwich at the restaurant across the street. He ran in, dashed back out and into the path of an oncoming train and was killed. So uh, you, you see the, the story of his life written on the Book of Life and at the bottom of the monument uh, a rendition of a train locomotive and coal car. And unfortunately this is a marble stone and it's wearing away but uh, hopefully this, uh, the inscription and the design will last a few more years. This uh, section of the cemetery that we're at right now where Mr. Cochran is buried, uh, Beck Street is right behind us, am I correct? That's right, and this is generally referred to as the Beck Street section of the cemetery. Now Beck Street was opened in 1898 by Mayor A.M. Beck. Uh, it was a after he uh, went out of the boot and shoe business, he went into the real estate and land business, and this was one of his ventures, the opening of Beck Street. And, of course, it bears his name. We, when we visited Aaron Pardee's grave, I mentioned that he had donated a third of an acre to the cemetery for burial purposes. And then the following year, in 1876, his brother, Judge Alan Pardee, sold six more acres to the cemetery. And with the close of the 19th century, more and more space was needed and continued to expand up in this direction. And Beck Street is uh, the Beck Street section is one of those that was added at that time. Mm -hmm. As we're going back up the hill, I just wanted to point one thing out. Uh, earlier, you had used the word headstone. And which, of course, is another term for a marker or a monument. But here on this particular grave, we see an example of a headstone, which is of the type that might have been ordered from a Sears Roebuck type company. It was a very standard design. And then before us are footstones that would mark the opposite end of the grave. Now, this was much more common in the in earlier years. You, it's unusual to find them this late as, as 1910 or 1919. But uh, it is an example where they have the, the large marker giving the information and then a smaller marker uh, showing where the actual burial is located. The Woodlawn Cemetery was not mechanized until 1963. Prior to that time, all of the graves had to be dug by hand in the old style with a, a pick and a shovel. And in 1885, the undertaking firm of Kramer and Opplinger built this receiving vault right behind where we're standing now. And in those days, uh, during inclement weather, a body would be placed in the receiving vault until conditions permitted mm -hmm. the digging of a grave. Now, of course, this looks like nice weather here, and this happens to be uh, the casket of Herbert Hard, known as Bert Hard, who was killed in the 1890s by an assassin, according to the only reports we have. He was a member of Company G, the 8th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and his father, Corwin Hard, is seated over to the right. By the 1930s, this building fell into disuse and was razed. Also in this cemetery was a private family vault, which was put in by the Wuchter family, which was the other family of undertakers. The Kramers coffined all the Democrats, and the Wuchters coffined all the Republicans. <laughs> and around this same time, around the 1880s, they built in the side of the hill where the bench the stone bench that we can see in the distance is uh, a receiving or a family vault. And when one of the members of the family died in the 1930s, the new styled casket would no longer, it was too big to fit into the crypt available. And they had the casket on folding chairs for some time, and they decided it wasn't quite appropriate. And so they tore the vault out of the side of the hill. Tommy Lucas and his sons did the destruction. Uh, and use the materials uh, for the foundations of homes they were building on Lucas Court, and the bodies were buried elsewhere in the side of the hill. We still do have two private mausoleums in the cemetery and one large public ma mausoleum. Well, let's go take a look at those, although this is a absolutely beautiful part of the cemetery. It certainly is. William B. Huntsberger was the son of the Reverend Ephraim Huntsberger, 
who was uh, the pastor of the Mennonite Church in Wadsworth and was responsible for Wadsworth uh, being the home of the Wadsworth Mennonite College. Uh, he was also a merchant, a boot and shoe dealer, and in 1884 he built the Huntsberger Block on Main Street, what we would now call uh, Bob Guthrie's building, or some of us know it as the Ladrack building. And uh, achieving prosperity, uh, he built a large home for his family, a brick home across from the present post office, though the porch has been removed and other uh, renovations have taken place over the years. And then, as the close of his life approached, Mr. Huntsberger built this mausoleum behind us uh, as a resting place for his family. In 1916, his son Walter, who had been a veteran of the Spanish-American War, died on his ranch in Montana, and his body was returned to Wadsworth for burial. And at that time, all of his comrades who were in town uh, from the Spanish-American War gathered uh, for uh, uh, the funeral and to have their photograph taken on that occasion. Now looking inside uh, the mausoleum here. Originally the mausoleum, as did all of the ones in the cemetery, contained stained glass windows, but as they were vandalized through the years they have been replaced and uh, now the windows are uh, plastic. Oh. The doors are bronze and the uh, mausoleum itself is of unpolished granite. The crypts are of marble. We can close the This is the interior view of another mausoleum, right, David? Jacob Detweiler made his fortune in the California gold rush, not panning for gold but by selling supplies to the other miners, and he was financially secure for life. His son, Dr. J.F. Detweiler, uh, was the owner of a drugstore in Wadsworth, at which was a popular gathering spot and was also the builder of the Wadsworth Opera House in 1895. He was one of the founders of the Wadsworth Salt Company and was very active in all community affairs. He was also a founder of the First National Bank of Wadsworth. The doctor's sister, Ida May, married Dr. T.C. Leiter. Dr. Leiter was a dentist who had his office on College Street and built a residence that later became Wadsworth's first library. Mrs. Everhard bought the Leiter House in 1925 and donated it to the city as a library. Uh, he had died in 1910 of an appendicitis. Now, we talked a little bit ago about tombstones that are carved incorrectly or that have a name misspelled on them and that often they couldn't be replaced because of the cost involved and the people not being able to afford it. Here's an example of perhaps one of the most costly monuments in our cemetery, the Detweiler Leiter Mausoleum. And when the last member of the family died, Ida Mae uh, Leiter, she was placed in the crypt in 1955, and her name was incorrectly lettered on uh, the plate. Instead of Ida Mae Detweiler Leiter, it's inscribed Ida Mae Leiter Detweiler. So I guess that proves that when we all come to this end, <laughs> we're, we're all equal. None of us are protected from some of the human, human mistakes. Exactly. I think you'd agree, Lucy, that there's a, a wealth of history contained within these acres that constitute our Woodlawn Cemetery. And we welcome people to come and, and walk and and visit the graves of friends and relatives who've gone on before, and also to learn a little more about the history of our town. But uh, particularly with Halloween approaching, I think it's important that we remember that this is sacred ground, it is private property, that it's not here as a, a bicycle path or a jogging track or a place to walk dogs. And we ask that people who come here respect the solemnity of the place and to respect those who've gone on before and their survivors. That was very well said, David. I agree.
I also hope that I can persuade you to come back here at another time and we can cover some of the newer sections um, that have very interesting headstones and see a little bit more about the cemetery. Certainly. Thank you for watching for In Touch. I'm Lucy Sondles. You want to do it again?